Bryce, what are you doing? Trying to, you know, game. <laughs> what? This game is really hard. Pac-Man? Uh, yeah. Dude, you're supposed to be playing the game for next week's episode of Arcade Bookshop. I mean... Uh, I will. I'm really close to beating this. Right. And what about the book? Huh? We're supposed to finish a book for the podcast, too? Oh, yeah. I finished that last week. Yes! Oh, did you finally beat it? Uh-huh. The first level. Oh, boy. You can listen to new episodes of Arcade Bookshop every other Monday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your pods. You'll always find us with a controller in one hand and a book in the other. You want to know one of my writing pet peeves? Sure. When you don't know the correct amount of usage for the character's name. Oh my god. And I say this because I just read your story. Yeah, and I use and I a... can tell you're sitting there going, "How many times am I going to say the name Nick, or yeah. should I use he?" Yeah, it's fucking irritating. It's it, it uh it's a pet peeve, and it's just one of the like it's a pet peeve as you read in it because if it's done wrong, it can be annoying. But it's also like as the, on the writing side, it's such a hard thing to kind of judge, and because that's where reading it out loud helps. Yeah, because. It, the, the main problem comes with, well, I just won't use the name that much, but then sometimes when you have other male characters yeah. or more than one female character or whatever, whatever the pronouns are, it can get confusing. Mm -hmm. And then, wait, wait a minute, who's the, who's doing the action? Who's talking? Yeah. When, when you get a couple of hymns and, and theirs and they, like, you yeah. know, it's just like, I feel like it might slow it down or muddy it up a little bit, but also clears it up because, like, then, I don't know, it's, it's very... Because you said that the last time you you read the first part of the story was like, and it's and it's only mainly two characters for yeah. the most part, and, and it's like, uh, how do I make you know, especially when they're both a part in like in the scene to make sure that you know it's clear on who's doing what and saying what. Maybe you just go old school '90s The Rock and just ref have the character always refer to themselves by <laughs> their name, like in third person. <laughs> And then the Nick went <laughs> and he said this and he did this, and then the Nick. Well, I, you say that. That's very much like um in the in the Divine Comedy like it would be like and then my master said to he and whatever and then I said to him what like you know in you know in the poem format. Mm. Oh, I can't wait to read that. <laughs> anyway, folks, we have to rush this episode because I was late editing the episode for tomorrow, which is this last week. week. Yeah, last week. No, it's last week. I don't know. But anyway, we have to rush this because my wife's coming home soon and she's still going. We're going to be mid episode when she oh, comes yeah. home, probably. But we have some more guests that are going to be coming on after Thanksgiving. I try to give us a little break from serious episodes. So today we'll do a little reading and talking about some writing stuff. And then we'll ramble for a while. And then that'll be end of the episode. End of the episode. But then after Thanksgiving, we get serious again. Again, yeah. that's some award-winning writers that want to be on the podcast. For some fucking reason. Why? Why? Did they listen? They, if they can't. Listen, they can't. If they listen to last week's episode, <laughs> they're, they're going to be like, no, never mind. That oh, was wrong. The, oh, you mean the episode that will that you just finished? Yeah, that's going to yeah, be, be it. Last, yeah. last week is the, this one drops. It's, yeah. It's gross. Gross. <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> You are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me, as always, Spencer, the Monterey Muppet Maker Church. Yeah. Making Muppets. Mm -hmm. You were going to have another verb. <laughs> yeah. But we've used that verb uh, many a time. I'm sure. So we couldn't do it. But I could see you with them holes in the bottoms of the Muppets <laughs> with your big fist. Yeah. You know, to make them talk. Talk, yes. That's, you make, to move them about. When you were in the mob, that's how you made people talk. Mm-hmm. So today's episode, I haven't decided on the title, but I figured we could break down a couple very short stories. All right. 
uh, see why they're effective and why people like them, perhaps. This first story is very bleak. I actually read this before. This comes from David Foster Wallace's uh, Oblivion Stories. So we did a whole IRC, me and Ashley, on uh, this collection. And this is the one story that kind of fucked with both of us. Yeah. Him so more than me because he's an actual father. Oh, yeah. But this is a rough story. But it is very short. It's only like a page or a page and a half. Which is very... For un- him, yeah. yeah. It's very not normal. That's why it stood out. But if you are sensitive to child hurting, I guess. What Endangerment. Would be- no, the child is beyond endangerment in the story. Harm upon a child. If that is something that would trigger you, specifically like a baby, not sexual, there's no mm. sexual stuff. But just it, violence. Uh, just a bad accident. Oh, I'll tell you the name of the story. Mm. That'll immediately you tell you what it's about. Okay. Uh, the Incarnations of Burned Children. Mm. So the children mm, yeah. is burned and it's very... Uh, yeah. It's a very well-written story, but it is graphic. So if this is not your bag... Uh, maybe skip this uh, a couple minutes and then go into we have Penny Dreadfuls. I am reading a story called Buried Alive. It's uh, I think the original Buried Alive story, not oh. Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, so we'll read that. It's a Penny Dreadful. Uh, so page 114, Spethor. One to the 14. And then Caleb accidentally slips into the very first story. As various intervals throughout the pre-GRDS presentation, the limmy portions of Schmidt's brain pursued the line of thinking, while in fact a whole other part of his... Four <laughs> hours later, each other to see below the Berg's cast public mask and... Co- <laughs> Why did I fucking read like, this? That's not like a story. Like... <laughs> It's like the first story in the collection, and it just goes on and on with just, it's just one block. Oh my God, I, I don't know how you guys did that. It was very rough, and we I was very optimistic when I went into it. I was like, this will be a challenge. It was. Mm-hmm. And it, unfortunately, drinking did not help these stories. This story I actually did rather like, though. It was pretty effed up. So, I shall start now. I guess I can meet you, huh? Mm-hmm. So they don't hear you fine. My fine. Incarnations of Burned Children. The daddy was around the side. Of, and you have to pay attention to this, Spencer, because I'm we are going to talk about it. And now I see you immediately think about mm, dinner, spaghetti, a meatball, French a hoagie. Fr- French fried potatoes. You're mute, you're muted. French fried potatoes. <laughs> did I mute the wrong one? I did. You're not <laughs> muted. You weren't <laughs> muted at all. Now you're muted. So you're just screaming into the mic. <laughs> Could you imagine if you read that whole story and you wasn't muted? <laughs> I forgot I moved your channel because your knob was all fucked up. Incarnations of burned children. We should not be so jovial about this. This is not a fun fun story. The daddy was around the side of the house hanging a door for the tenant when he heard the child's screams and the mommy's voice gone high between them. He could move fast and the back porch gave on to the kitchen and before the screen door had banged shut behind him, the daddy had taken the scene in whole. The overturned pot on the floor tile before the stove and the burner's blue jet in the floor's pool of water still steaming as its many arms extended. The toddler in his baggy diaper standing rigid with steam coming off his hair and his chest and shoulders scarlet and his eyes rolled up and mouth open very wide and seeming somehow separate from the sounds that issued. The mommy down on one knee with the dish rag dabbing pointlessly at him and matching the screams with cries of her own, hysterical so she was almost frozen. Her one knee and the bare little soft feet were still in the steaming pool, and the daddy's first act was to take the child under the arms and lift him away from it and take him to the sink where he threw out plates and struck the tap to let cold well water run over the boy's feet while with his cupped hand he gathered and poured or flung more cold water over the head and shoulders and chest, wanting first to see the steam stop coming off him, the mommy over his shoulder invoking God until he sent her for towels and gauze if they had it. The daddy moving quickly and well and his man's mind empty of everything but purpose, not yet aware of how smoothly he moved or that he'd cease to hear the high screams because to hear them would freeze him and make impossible what had to be done to help his own child, whose screams were regular as breath and went on so long they'd become already a thing in the kitchen, something else to move quickly around. The tenant side door outside hung half off its top hinge and moved slightly in the wind, and a bird in the oak across the driveway appeared to observe the door with the cocked head as the cry still came from inside. The worst scald seemed to be the right arm and shoulder, the chest and stomach's red was fading to pink under the cold water, and his feet soft soles weren't blistered that the daddy could see, but the toddler still made little fist and screamed except maybe now merely on reflex from fear. The daddy would know he thought it possible later, small face descended and thready veins standing out at the temples, and the daddy kept saying he was here, he was here, 
adrenaline ebbing in anger at the mommy for allowing this thing to happen just starting to gather and wisp at his mind's extreme rear and still hours from expression. When the mommy returned, he wasn't sure whether to wrap the child in a towel or not, but he wet the towel down and did, swaddled him tight and lifted his baby out of the sink and set him on the kitchen table's edge to soothe him while the mommy tried to check the feet soles with one hand waving around in the area of her mouth and uttering objectless words while the daddy bent in and was face to face with the child on the table's checked edge repeating the fact that he was here and trying to calm the toddler's cries but still the child breathlessly screamed a high pure shining sound that could stop his heart and his bitty lips and gums now tinged with the light blue of a low flame, the daddy thought, screaming as if o almost still under the tilted pot in pain, a minute, two, like this, that seemed much longer, with the mommy at the daddy's side talking sing-song at the child's face, and the lark on the limb with its head to the side and the hinge going white, and a line from the weight of the canted door until the first seen wisp of steam came lazy from under the wrapped towel's hem, and the parent's eyes met and widened. The diaper, which when they opened the towel and leaned their little boy back on the checkered cloth and unfastened the softened tabs and tried to remove it, resisted slightly with new high cries and was hot. Their baby's diaper burned their hands and they saw where the real water had fallen and pooled and been burning their baby boy all this time while he screamed for them to help him and they hadn't. Hadn't thought and when they got it off and saw the state of what was there, the mommy said their God's first name and grabbed the table to keep her feet while the father turned away and threw a haymaker at the air of the kitchen and cursed both himself and the world for not the last time while his child might now have been sleeping if not for the rate of his breathing and the tiny stricken motions of his hands in the air above where he lay. Hands the size of a grown man's thumb that had clutched the daddy's thumb in the crib while he watched the daddy's mouth move in song. His head cocked and seeming to see way past him into something his eyes made the daddy's lonesome for in a sideways way. If you've never wept and want to, have a child. Break your heart inside and something will a child is the twangy song the daddy hears again, as if the radio's lady was almost there with him looking down at what they've done. Though hours later, what the daddy most won't forgive is how badly he wanted a cigarette right then as they diapered the child as best they could in gauze and two crossed hand towels and the daddy lifted him like a newborn with his skull in one palm and ran him out to the hot truck and burned custom rubber all the way to town and the clinic's ER with the tenant's door hanging open like that all day until the hinge gave, but by then it was too late. When it wouldn't stop and they couldn't make it, the child had learned to leave himself and watch the whole rest unfold from a point overhead, and whatever was lost never thenceforth mattered, and the child's body expanded and walked about and drew pay and lived its life unattended, a thing among things, itself sold to so much vapor aloft, falling as rain and then rising, the sun up and down like a yo-yo. That's actually a very hard story to read because it's almost all run on sentences yeah, it's like, like i couldn't catch my breath a lot like it's yeah. hard to fucking keep good because it's all just one i mean it's not all one sentence but it's there's probably four or five sentences in this whole story but it's all just one run on i didn't say is it just one big paragraph the whole thing like yeah pretty much yeah it's all one paragraph because like you didn't it didn't seem like there was any break as you were reading it no and I know David Foster likes to David Foster Wallace likes to do this with his writing is just have these big breaks or these big blocks with no breaks. But this story, I thought it was more purposeful because especially at the beginning with this run on breath, like if you're reading like mm. I was, you keep getting breathless. That's, I think, how you're supposed to feel in the moment if you were yeah. the parents. Like, you're breathless. Right. It's rushed. It's panic. It's just go, go, go. No thought. Mm. So he wrote it like this. So you just keep going and go. Like, you have to just keep going. You can't stop. So it was weird that it was almost written as if, like, it was from, like, a point of view of, like, another child almost, too, sometimes. Well, the ending gets weird where it's, like, this ethereal, the child's outside of itself. Yeah. Uh, that I never quite understood. Was, uh, I was thinking that the baby died. No, it's because it's, uh, I don't know, maybe. I'm not sure. I don't think the baby died, but then it doesn't actually state it, so maybe it did. Maybe that was his soul. I mean, That's, I could see it die. Like, that yeah. was, I mean, just in general, it's an awful scenario. Right. But I, I liked also the character breakdown of this is how the man reacts, 
and it's all action yeah. but no thought yeah. and he's trying to help but then he ends up missing the biggest thing because he didn't think and then the woman's action is immediately just to soothe and protect and be there but she doesn't do anything to help the yeah. baby either yeah, and ultimately yeah. the baby suffers by their own fail you know by both parents failures uh and my favorite line in this whole story is let me see if i can so i like this line so daddy kept saying he was here he was here adrenaline ebbing and an anger at the mommy for allowing this thing to happen just starting to gather in wisp at his mind's extreme rear and still hours from expression yeah so he thinks it's her fault yeah but he doesn't know that yet. Like, and his yeah. mind hasn't completely formed that I'm going to blame her. Yeah. He, like, he's so he's so worried about trying to take on the thing that's happening now. But even in that moment, he's still in the back of his mind. like, that goddamn bitch. Yeah. I wish uh, he would have went into the woman's thought process a little more. He obviously... Well, David Foster Wallace, I think, was a no misogynist. Oh. So it's not like he's going to write women right. in a positive way, probably. But that would have been interesting to see, like, the mom's thought process towards the dad, mm -hmm. like him rushing in. But most likely, uh, her character probably just felt it was her fault anyway. Yeah. Because that's generally, I mean, even if, you you know, you were in the kitchen yeah. making a pot of hot water and to pour it on the kid, you're just immediately yeah, thinking, gonna, yeah. like, that's, that's not really a gender thing. That's more just a, a person-specific event thing. But I, I always thought that was a really interesting story. And I would just imagine if I, like, you were the parent. Yeah. Like, you would never get over that. And I kind of remember you guys talking about that from from the episode. But, like, then as you were reading it, like, I didn't, like, it's not a, from from what I know and can gather from David Foster Wallace, from, just from, like, you guys, is, like, not only, like, that way he kind of, he likes to write, but isn't it stuff more normally kind of, like, not, like, sci-fi, but, like, kind of, like, um... It's more analytical than anything. Yeah, so, like, that is not what I would think. You know, because, like, that's not what that story is. That's a very human story. Yeah. And his story is almost unthinking robot type of stories. Like, most of his stories deal with, uh, like I said, like, analytical thought. Uh, so I don't know why he didn't. I mean, maybe he did. I haven't read a lot of his work. So I don't know if he wrote more stories like that. Right. But if not, I don't know why he didn't because that was a good story. Yeah, and say, like, I would be more tempted to read stuff like that even if it you know how messed up of a subject matter it is yeah. i don't it's know it's a like, real human experience yeah other than whatever the fucking i just remember some of the stuff you were talking about from the other stories from that collection i just well some of the stories in there when he gets to the human stuff is really good but then he just gets so bogged down with these stupid details and just analytical and again it's all very like he went into every story with like intent purpose like intense purpose so like, that is written exactly how he wanted that message conveyed in that story. And same with his other stories. So whatever you're feeling when you read those stories, that's how he wanted you to feel most yeah. likely. So, like, that story... Or at least what he was trying to get you to feel. Yeah, so that story, you know, you're shocked and you're breathless and you just feel, even though it's so short, like, you were just beat up. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a rough story to read and that's exactly what he wanted. And just like the way it unfolds and he leaves that last detail out to almost the end where it's like, oh, no, the real problem was in the baby's diaper. Yeah. And then you're just like, oh, like the other ball drops. You're like, what the fuck? And, it, and it's such a good one as in a way because it's like you could see that be something very easily missed. Yeah. In that scenario. Like, oh, yeah, for sure. Like, because they thought that, you know, they thought it was okay. But then, because you think it burnt their hands. Yeah. Like, the diaper burnt their hands. So, what did it do to that baby? Like, good God. So, he was able to give graphic detail without going into any graphic detail. Well, whenever he mentioned that it get, it wouldn't give at first, you're like, oh, no. It's melted. like noted to his skin. Like, mm, that's rough. Okay, so this one, it looks like it's short. It's only a page and a half, but it's a bigger book. Yeah. So we're completely switching genres and everything. I've never read this one. Mm. The Buried Alive by John Galt. Mm. So I think this is the first Buried Alive story, or at least mainstream one. This is uh, Penny Dreadful. So this was, I don't have the date on this story, but I'm sure it was early 1800s, Probably. mid 1800s. The Buried Alive by John Galt. I had been for some time ill of a low and lingering fever. My strength gradually wasted, but the sense of life seemed to become more and more acute as my corporal powers became weaker. I could see by the looks of the doctor that he despaired of my recovery, and the soft and whispering sorrow of my friends taught me that I had nothing to hope. One day towards the evening, the crisis took place. I was seized with a strange and indescribable quivering. A rushing sound was in my ears. I saw around my couch innumerable strange faces. They were bright and visionary and without bodies. 
There was light and solemnity, and I tried to move but could not. For a short time, a terrible confusion overwhelmed me, and when it passed off, all my recollection returned with the most perfect distinctness, but the power of motion had departed. I heard the sound of weeping at my pillow, and the voice of the nurse say, He is dead. I cannot describe what I felt at these words. I exerted my utmost power of volition to stir myself, but I could not move even an eyelid. After a short pause, my friend drew near, and sobbing and convulsed with grief, drew his hand over my face and closed my eyes. The world was then darkened, but I could still hear and feel and suffer. When my eyes were closed, I heard by the attendants that my friend had left the room, and I soon after found the undertakers were preparing to habit me in the garments of the grave. Their thoughtlessness was more awful than the grief of my friends. They laughed at one another as they turned me from side to side and treated what they believed a corpse with the most appalling ribaldry. When they had laid me out, these wretches retired, and the degrading formality of affected mourning commenced. For three days a number of friends called to see me. I heard them, in low accents, speak of what I was, and more than one touched me with his finger. On the third day some of them talked of the smell of corruption in the room. The coffin was procured. I was lifted and laid in. My friend placed my head on what was deemed its last pillow, and I felt his tears drop on my face. When all who had any peculiar interest in me had for a short time looked at me in the coffin, I heard them retire, and the undertaker's men placed the lid on the coffin and screwed it down. There were two of them present. One had occasion to go away before the task was done. I heard the fellow who was left begin to whistle as he turned the screw nails, but he checked himself and completed the work in silence. I was then left alone. Everyone shunned the room. I knew, however, that I was not yet buried, and though darkened and motionless, I still had hope, but this was not permitted long. The day of interment arrived. I felt the coffin lifted and borne away. I heard and felt it placed in the hearse. There was a crowd of people around. Some of them spoke sorrowfully of me. The hearse began to move. I knew that it carried me to the grave. It halted, and the coffin was taken out. I felt myself carried on the shoulders of men, but the inequality of the motion. A pause ensued. I heard the cords of the coffin move. I felt its swing as depended by them. It was lowered and rested on the bottom of the grave. The cords were dropped upon the lid. I heard them fall. Dreadful was the effort I then made to exert the power of action, but my whole frame was immovable. Soon after, a few handfuls of earth were thrown upon the coffin. Then there was another pause, after which the shovel was employed, and the sound of the rattling mold as it covered me was far more tremendous than thunder. But I could make no effort. The sound gradually became less and less, and by a surging reverberation in the coffin, I knew that the grave was filled up, and that the sexton was treading in the earth, slapping the grave with the flat of his spade. This too ceased, and then all was silent. I had no means of knowing the lapse of time, and the silence continued. This is death, thought I, and I am doomed to remain in the earth till the resurrection. Presently the body will fall into corruption, and the Epicurean worm that is only satisfied with the flesh of man will come to partake of the banquet that has been prepared for him with so much selectitude and care. In the contemplation of this hideous thought, I heard a low and undersound in the earth over me, and I fancied that the worms and the reptiles of death were coming, that the mole and the rat of the grave would soon be upon me. The sound continued to grow louder and nearer. Can it be possible, I thought, that my friends suspect they have buried me too soon? The hope was truly like light bursting through the gloom of death. The sound ceased, and presently I felt the hands of some dreadful being working about my throat. They dragged me out of the coffin by the head. I felt again the living air, but it was piercingly cold, and I was carried swiftly away. I thought to judgment, perhaps perdition. When borne to some distance, I was then thrown down like a clod, it was not upon the ground. A moment after, I found myself on a carriage, and, by the interchange of two or three brief sentences, I discovered that I was in the hands of two of those robbers who lived by plundering the grave and selling the bodies of parents and children and friends. One of the men sung snatches and scraps of obscene songs as the cart rattled over the pavement of the streets. When it halted, I was lifted out, and I soon perceived by the closeness of the air and the change of temperature that I was carried into a room, 
and, being rudely stripped of my shroud, was placed naked on a table. By the conversation of the two fellows with the servant who admitted them, I learned that I was that night to be dissected. My eyes were still shut. I saw nothing. But in a short time I heard, by the hustle in the room, that the students of anatomy were assembling. Some of them came around the table and examined me minutely. They were pleased to find that so good a subject had been procured. The demonstrator himself at last came in. Previous to beginning the dissection, he proposed to try on me some gallivantic experiment, and an apparatus was arranged for that purpose. The first shock vibrated through all my nerves. They rung and jangled like the strings of a harp. The students expressed their admiration at the convulsive effect. The second shock threw my eyes open, and the first person I saw was the doctor who had attended me. But still I was as dead. I could, however, discover among the students the faces of many with whom I was familiar, and when my eyes were open, I heard my name pronounced by several of the students with an accent of awe and compassion and a wish that it had been some other subject. When they had satisfied themselves with the galvanic phenomena, the demonstrator took the knife and pierced me on the bosom with the point. I felt a dreadful crackling, as it were, throughout my whole frame. A convulsive shuddering instantly followed, and a shriek of horror rose from all present. The ice of death was broken up, my trance ended, the utmost exertions were made to restore me, and in the course of an hour I was in the full possession of all my faculties. So I'm pretty sure that one Stephen King story in the morgue, I don't remember the name of it, but where... Uh, he gets, like, that golfer gets bit by a snake. Yeah, yeah, then they go to dissect him. I think that definitely was direct inspiration from that. Probably. It definitely, definitely has a lot of um, similar themes and stuff like that. I really, really enjoyed how he went through the whole process of, you know, being thought of as dead. And then what it feels like to hear your friends yeah. and your family weep over you. And especially the fucking asshole attendants who are just like, yeah, you know, joking around mm -hmm. being dicks. And it's like, this is what probably written 100, 200 years ago. And that's exactly how those funeral people still act sometimes. Right. Well, as I was saying, that's an interesting too of like of what, not only what it's like to go through that process, but what it would be like to go through that part process during that time period. Oh yeah, it'd be much more brutal. Uh, the thing that was interesting to me was that he was like a dead in a room for three because they didn't have bomb back then. Yeah. So it was like three days. He was a uh, quote unquote dead in the room, and uh, people started to smell him, mm -hmm. but he wasn't dead yet. So that's that's weird, but I could imagine like when that story came out, people were like, God damn, because that yeah. happened a lot too. People just getting buried oh, prematurely. Yeah. But could you imagine just like you can feel and hear and see everything, but you can't move, mm. and everyone just thinks you're dead. But like the tension building of that story is really good too, because you're like, is he gonna make it? Is he actually dead? Yeah. Is this what the life is like after? Well, I guess life, uh, not life after death, but is this what it's like when you die? Mm. Are you just forever conscious, but? Stuck, yeah, because that would be a fate worse than death, in my opinion. Is you're just underground, just stuck, oh. had to feel the worms eat your body. And uh, I have the uh, what was getting me was the um, the grave robbers, and yeah, you know, like they get pulled up by the neck and <laughs> yeah, just thrown that had to hurt. But if it wasn't for those shitty grave robbers, he wouldn't have came back, yeah, he would have had a rot in the ground until he fucking starved to death or got eaten alive. Either way, that's terrible. So I enjoy that story as well, but that I know you notice even though that's a lot older story, it's a lot easier to read than that David Foster. Wallace. Yeah, a lot more comma breaks, and it, that's one thing a lot of modern writers I don't think do as well as the old writers is pacing. Yeah, they don't seem to pace. the The one thing strange about that story you couldn't tell because you weren't reading the physical words, but a lot of m dashes. Oh really? Yeah, instead of a commas, a lot of m dashes to break up the sentences. I thought was strange. Maybe that was just the thing back then. Like that was more the common. Maybe I don't know. You know, as like language grows and and then you know the, the the rules change. The rules, man. I got one more for you. Okay. I, I'm looking it up because I don't actually have one more. No. I'm gonna get a, fly, a famous flash fiction piece. Oh, baby, I like it raw. That's what we should do. We should break down some Wu Tang songs. That would be cool. I we couldn't say a lot of them. Yeah. This isn't a flash fiction, I don't think. I think it's an opening of uh, this story. Hold on. This is Hemingway. Chapter 5, Ernest Hemingway. For sale, baby shoes never worn. We all know that. Yeah. Uh, oh, it, for sale, baby shoes never worn is far from Hemingway's only foray into flash fiction if it was indeed his story. But, you know, we went over that before. 
This story from his collection, In Our Time, follows the typical arc of great flash fiction by starting with a straightforward but descriptive sentence to set the scene. So this is flash fiction. It's literally like a paragraph. They shot the six cabinet ministers at half past six in the morning against the wall of a hospital. There were pools of water in the courtyard. There were wet dead leaves on the paving of the courtyard. It rained hard. All the shutters of the hospital were nailed shut. One of the ministers was sick with typhoid. Two soldiers carried him downstairs and out into the rain. They tried to hold him up against the wall, but he sat down in a puddle of water. The other five stood very quietly against the wall. Finally, the officer told the soldiers it was no good trying to make him stand up. When they fired the first volley, he was sitting down in the water with his head on his knees. So a guy was executed. So that's the typical Hemingway style of every word is pretty much needed there. Yeah. To just convey the message as is. Oh, here's the even more famous, apparently. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates has a four-word story. Ooh. I kept myself alive. Mm. Nah, that's not a story, is it? At least not, you have to give some context. (laughs) Yeah. Here, you might like this one, Franz Kafka. Ooh. It was very early in the morning. The streets clean and deserted. I was walking to the station. As I compared the tower clock with my watch, I realized that it was already much later than I had thought. I had to hurry. The shock of this discovery made me unsure of the way. I did not yet know my way very well in this town. Luckily, a policeman was nearby. I ran up to him and breathlessly asked him the way. He smiled and said, From me, you want to know the way? Yes, I said, since I cannot find it myself. Give it up! Give it up, he said, and turned away with a sudden jerk, like people who want to be alone with their laughter. Franz Kafka had some weird complexes. Yeah. And I think that's a a perfect example of uh, internalizing your social anxiety of creating a scenario. So I could imagine, like, oh, I better ask for directions. No, I can't. It's too. Yeah. What if they hate me? What if they do what that guy did? It's, like, a, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, that's what I, I get. Here's an Edgar Allan Poe one. Every year, Thanksgiving night, we flocked out behind Dad as he dragged the Santa suit. Well, that can't be Edgar Allan Poe, is it? George, Sa- George Saunders. No. I don't want to read George Saunders. Fuck George Saunders. Here's one from Taylor Swift. <laughs> what? Is that right? Hold on, I'm actually going to have to read this. Taylor Swift, Hugh Bem Steinberg. Oh, it's the title to Taylor Swift. All right. Uh, We're not going to read any more of these. We get the gist of it. We got to go. So to write a good story, Spencer, write it. Just write it. Write it. If people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't like it. And that's what makes it good. That's like anything else. Yeah. That's breaking down short stories for no apparent reason. <laughs> I didn't I didn't care for them flash fiction stories so much. No. Not much there. Flash mm. fiction's hard. It like is. to have a good story. Well, remember whenever we first started trying to do flax fishing like that, like it it was pretty difficult. I mean, I I think at the time it might not have been as hard because that was just where our skill set was at yeah. the time. But now it's almost like it's like a weird like I'm gonna go down and wait and just focus on form, and it's just like yeah. oh my form is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 rough. But anyway, folks, if you like this kind of episode, uh, let us know. You know, you know what to do. You know what to do. This is a short episode. We give you a bye week. That's what this really is, is a bye week. I don't even make it a DBS episode just so you don't take it seriously. Uh, if you want to check out Spencer, he is the Monterey Muppet Maker Church. Yep. You got to make a lot of Muppets. It's a very educational Yes. Only fans this week. Yes. Uh, if you want to check us out at DPW Podcast on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, YouTube. YouTube. I think that's about it. And you can check me out at com with the stories, and you can keep up with my publishing news and stuff like that. Uh, me and Spencer, Spencer and I both have some stories we've been working on. Working on some things. So by the time this episode comes out, hopefully they're both submitted. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. So anyway, thanks for listening. We'll check you out next week. Hey, Caleb, you wanted to see me? Ah, Spencer, my good fellow. I've been expecting you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so did you want something or... Want? Goodness no. Require. Require? Yes. 
I require your services for the briefest of moments. Okay. Surely you can see the predicament I'm in. Well, actually, no, I can't. I lost my glasses at the pub last night. A pub, you say? Surely you can't be serious. As serious as a fart during a recto exam. And stop calling me Shirley. Rightio. Anyway, if your spectacles were affixed upon your face, you'd see that I, the host of the most prodigious writing and books podcast in the business, has been immobilized by a rather substantial stack of fallen folios. What? My to-read pile finally fell on me while I was taking a nap. But you're on a podcast table. I hardly see how that matters. And you're naked! I hardly see how that matters. Dude, your hairy ass is touching my drink coaster. I hardly see how that matters. It matters to me! Can you just unbury me? No way! Your reckless reading got you into this mess. Blockhead! Wait! Don't go! There's a copy of War and Peace wedged in my taint! Spencer! Can you at least leave me a bottle of whiskey? Hello? Can't get enough drunken nonsense? Listen to new episodes of the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast every Tuesday wherever you get your pods.